Hello, everyone. This is Shane Gibson with RackN and Digital Rebar Provision. Welcome to yet another uh, meetup, version 17, on this day, May 8, 2018. We're excited to bring you a action-packed day. We're going to have a demo on WebSockets uh, by myself, and then uh, Victor will lead us with a little bit of a demo on user management as it relates to our new RBAC controls. Uh, we'll have some open discussion on tenancy in RBAC itself, and then, as always, we'll open up to community uh, for questions, comments, thoughts, ideas, whatever's on your mind, all things digital rebar provision. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we have online with us from Rackton, we have Rob Hirschfeld, who's uh, surfing uh, the meetup today from uh, um, somewhere in the U.S. in an airport, so he's mostly going to be on mute in the background. Uh, and then we have Greg Althaus and Victor Lowther. Uh, so uh, we also have Stan Chan, who has joined us from uh, the community. So welcome, everybody. Hey. Hello. Uh, let's go ahead and kick off. Uh, I'm going to do a little demo on WebSockets. For those of you uh, who know what WebSockets is, uh, apologize for a little bit of the background, but a little bit of the background for those of you who don't know what WebSockets is. Uh, WebSockets is just a standard protocol that allows us to uh, emit information from an API service. Uh, we use that in Digital Rebar fairly heavily to uh, provide logging information. Uh, within the Digital Rebar provision, uh, read the docs site. We have some integration information uh, that talks a little bit about our WebSockets event. Essentially, a WebSocket is, uh, you can subscribe to the WebSocket service, which is a standard protocol, so any client or any library that can, can speak WebSockets can connect to and register for specific events to listen to the WebSocket service. And you can specify different filters to determine exactly what WebSocket events you want to listen to, uh, by specifying a triplet pattern. Um, all of this information is sort of on the, the Read the Docs site, so we sort of talk, we talk about uh, how to connect to the WebSocket service within Digital Rebar Provision. So we have the basic structure of the URL request that we serve the WebSockets event, and then you submit a register event after you do a connect to register for events. So the, the type of events in that triplet are type, action, and key. Uh, the type relates to something like profiles or params or machines, so you can filter exactly what you want to listen to. Uh, the action can be the, uh, the uh, CRUD operation, so it can be a create, save, update, destroy, those sorts of actions that relate to uh, what has occurred to that uh, type of object that you've requested to. Uh, and a key is a given specific uh, item within that WebSocket stream that you'd like to listen to. So for example, a specific machine UUID or a profile name. Um, you can also selectively deregister events. So you can register for events and deregister events and stop receiving those events on the same WebSocket connection. You don't have to connect and reconnect to change what you want to do. There are a number, um, we're getting a lot of uh, feedback. Um, I'm not sure whose mic that is, but thank you very much for muting whoever that was. Um, there are a number of WebSocket uh, libraries that you can use to uh, embed within any application that you're using, Golang, Python, JavaScript. Uh, essentially, Google is your friend, but there are a number of WebSocket events or uh, libraries out there. We've documented a few of them on the Read the Docs page. Uh, there are also some basic uh, uh, plugins or add-ons that you can add to your browser that allow you to play around with WebSocket events. Um, so I've listed a couple here, and that's what I'm going to uh, show a quick demo of today using what's called the Smart WebSocket Client, which is a very simple uh, WebSocket uh, that uh, plugin that in the browser that lets you see WebSocket events. Uh, and then uh, when you connect, you need to connect using the WS or the WSS, which is WebSocket Secure. And since we use TLS encryption on our WebSocket events, uh, you use WSS colon as the URI uh, portion of the URL. And then the address of your DRP server and the API port 
uh, and then the traditional API v3, and then you do WS, and then your token, your login token information to authenticate. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, after that, you would essentially, whatever events are generating uh, actions, uh, um, events will then be um, displayed to your WebSocket clients. In this example, uh, I have a, a quick uh, shell script that I chucked together. It's not exactly uh, gorgeous or super fancy, but basically it just runs a loop and I simply create a parameter and then destroy a parameter and go to sleep for a period of time. So that, that shell script uh, will sort of generate a bunch of parameter events. And what we can do to watch this happening in operation is after I do the registration on the WebSocket event, uh, we have our standard uh, UX, which has our standard event log. Uh, if you don't know where the event log is, you can connect to it by the little announce icon next to your endpoint, and it'll show you the current uh, events that are occurring on your machine. So I'm going to generate events in my shell script. We'll be able to see the events in the web UX. And then if I do everything right, we'll see the events in our simple uh, WebSocket client. Uh, the WebSockets are emitted as JSON, so it's sort of a big blob of JSON. Uh, and what you'll want to watch for is the name of the param will change from number dash one to number dash two as I go through each uh, loop iteration in the script. Uh, first, connecting. Uh, I've saved myself a little bit of grief by copying my uh, uh, connect uh, URL, in this case, the WSS colon blah, 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 host API, and my API or DRP endpoint is set up with the default rocket skates, rocket states. So if I connect, um, this, this uh, WebSocket client is pretty simple, doesn't give you a whole lot of feedback, but it says everything's ready to go, so we'll believe it. So the next thing we want to do is register for uh, events. So normally you could do star dot star dot star triplet to, for everything. But in this case, let's just show a little bit of filtering in what we want. So we're gonna do params dot star dot star. And then we say send. And we get a response back from the WebSocket service that says, okay, register. So theoretically, we're good to go here. Uh, I'm gonna fire off the shell script with 10 loops. So it's gonna create 10 WebSocket uh, param creates, or 10 events, uh, a param create, and then a subsequent param delete, because I don't wanna litter my DRP endpoint uh, with a whole bunch of miscellaneous params. You can see in my WebSockets, um, I had some previous runs I was playing around with, but you'll be able to see these actions occur both in the WebSocket client and in the um, event log. So I'm going to go ahead and kick that off uh, with 10, uh, 10, uh, whoops, 10 generates, and we'll watch things happen, hopefully. So we can see that the uh, JSON emits from the shell script from the DRCP CLI create command. And if we watch, we see the number dash six incrementing number dash seven. Uh, as we do the create and then the subsequent delete, uh, we see each of these WebSock events that are generated. So this is a, a very basic uh, example of usage of WebSockets you can use to integrate with your existing infra infrastructure. There are a lot of WebSocket libraries that let you listen to events. Uh, you can subscribe to specific events. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of the uh, plugins that we have uh, digital rebar and rack in is the Slack plugin, which essentially takes the WebSockets information and integrates with Slack's service to be able to provide events that are generated to a Slack, a given Slack channel for you. So that's an example of the WebSockets integration. Uh, you can do the, any sort of integration that makes sense in your environment. Uh, and that's sort of it in summary. We um, generated 10 creates, 10 destroys, uh, saw the params uh, create and destroy in the event log in the UX and our WebSocket events. So at this point, we would just disconnect our WebSocket client and we no longer are going to get events on that uh, listening client. Uh, that's, that's it in the summary. Uh, any questions on that, folks? Nope, okay, great. I like no questions, it's easy. Uh, again, I reference. Couldn't, I couldn't, I'm, 
Unselect. Can you filter um, on? Well, never mind. The the filtering and such matches the. Um, my brain. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. We have all the time in the world, Greg. The the triples match the role construction. By the way. Almost not entirely. I haven't pulled over the. In, in the RBAX uh, stuff, is that what you're referring to, Greg? Yeah, so those will be aligned or fairly close to each other. That's very nice. I did not know that. So um, what Greg's referring to is our, our recently released uh, RBAC role-based uh, authentication controls, um, access controls, uh, has a method of triplets for defining access requirements, and they're going to align similarly to the WebSocket events type action and key. That's right. The, awesome. the, the roles are, are richer than the events, but yes. Okay, so there we go. The roles are richer than the events. However, while we're aligning them, so it all hopefully makes sense in everybody's little brainscapes. Um, moving on, uh, Victor, are you um, ready to rock and roll on some RBAC user uh, coolness? Uh, Ready-ish. Let me just uh, my share my screen. Yep. Yes. Yeah. You'll have to stop sharing things. Is there any limitations on the WebSocket APIs? Can, can they listen um, to every any event that is uh, hap or happens on um, the provisioning server? Yeah, just listen for start up, start up, star, and you'll listen and you'll grab every event. That yeah. Can. Okay. Exactly. So the the like like you're saying, if you do star 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 triplet, it'll give you all event types, which is a probably a bit of an overwhelming amount of information sometimes, depending on how busy your PRP endpoint is. Um, but it's also a good tool to see what's emitted, so you can sort of learn how to scope uh, yeah, requests for exactly what you want. If you do that and turn login all the way up, you'll probably kill whatever is listening for events. Yeah, that's a good point. So um, what Victor's referring to is the boot amp, DHCP, render, default, all of these log levels, if you turn them up to uh, debug or trace levels, you'll pretty quickly cripple your TRP endpoint, as well as getting a tremendous amount of WebSocket events generated. Uh, so you want to be pretty selective with your log levels, and how much you turn those up. Uh, was that um, CJ? Was that your your question? I didn't I didn't catch it. Or was that Stan? It was Stan. That was me, Stan. Yeah. It was Stan. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Stan. Appreciate the question. Yeah. The other thing you can do is issue multiple register calls. So you can do like if you just want um, yeah machines yeah. Or, or whatever. So in this case, this uh, WebSocket event allows you to, and, and what Greg's referring to is being able to select the multiples of things that you want to register for and listen to. Uh, so um, presumably that means there isn't a very rich regex pattern capability. I haven't really explored the regex capabilities. But I know star works, so everything is star. Um, I'm not sure if there are other regexes like M star or something. No, there's not. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what I thought. A word or star, and if you want to listen for multiple things, you have to do multiple registers. Multiple registers, yeah. Okay, good, good points, good information. Uh, so again, questions. Uh, we have somewhere we had once upon a time somewhere in our code tree. Uh, we had an example Python uh, WebSocket thing. Ah, here it is still. Okay, so it's in the uh, provision. Uh, uh, GitHub under integrations WebSocket. So there's a WebSocket, a Python uh, uh, example. It's a very simple example, but if you're working in Python, it gives you uh, an idea of how you can do WebSockets within the Python language. I'm pretty sure that this works because I went through this a while back uh, and made some changes to vet it and, and make it work. Um, so I think it, um, I think it works just fine now. If it doesn't complain to us loudly on a pound community. Yeah, and uh, if you're looking for Go examples uh, in the API, um, 
the agent is implemented pretty much as a uh, listener for events. So that's a pretty good example of how to, uh, and I, I built some, some abstractions around for all websites to make the go side stuff easy to use. And, okay, yeah. so you're in the DRP CLI itself, uh, there's yeah. some good Golang examples. It's in the API. In the, in the APIs, okay. There's an API <clears throat> set up to manage uh, event listeners, basically. The event stream. Set Here we go, okay. So event stream .go. Um So presumably, uh, what library are we pulling in for that? Gorilla. Here we go, the Gorilla one, okay. Yeah, I think the Gorilla one is I referenced in, yeah, that's the first Golang one I referenced in the documentation. So um, the, the this is a good example, uh, like Victor was saying, for if you are operating in Golang, you wanna see how we deal with WebSockets using the Gorilla uh, Golang library. Cool. We didn't even coordinate that. We didn't even plan that. That's awesome. I love it when a plan comes together. Well, and the, oh, since wow. that agent is based off of it, you can be sure that this API is kept functioning at all times. That's right. <laughs> There you go. Um, so I, I didn't catch all of what you were saying, Victor. Were you ready to do uh, user stuff or should we move to something else? Uh, yeah, if you can uh, stop sharing so I can share. All right, sharing's all yours. All right. Do you want the microphone over there? Uh, yeah, let me uh, turn my sound up. Oh, you want to mute? Okay, can you all hear me? Yes. Yep. And uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can awesome. hear you. Good. Okay, so now I'm at my system. All right, and did I actually share my screen? Desktop to share screen. All right, there we go. So we don't have a good UX wrapped around the role code yet, so uh, my explorations are going to pretty much entirely be on the command line. So um, what I have added to the tip code is a, a set of abstractions based off around the same sort of triples that we use for eventing and uh, the web sockets to uh, do access controls on uh, what any given user is allowed to see or not see. Uh, so. so we have... Uh, Derp CLI now has roles, and a role is composed of uh, a list of claims that uh, give uh, specific privileges, or that give specific privileges when interacting with the API. By default with the new code, the uh, Rocket Skates user gets the super user role, which uh, allows it to do everything. Um, but that's a pretty boring demo, because you already know how uh, that works. You know, Rocket Skates can do anything on the, do anything on the system. Uh, so I've created three more restrictive roles. Uh, one that allows us just to uh, list machines that are present in the system. One that allows us to just get specific machines in the system without being able to list. And one that allows us to delete machines without being able to list or get them. And so uh, presumably, Victor, we have a, an associated DRP CLI and APIs today. Um, for creating all of these that you're showing us, presumably. Yeah, Derp CLI roles. Yep, perfect. So we just haven't wired the, the UX in yet to handle all of this structure. Uh, Greg is working on that. Well, you're correct. Greg is working on it. We haven't done it yet, though. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's all been exposed via the CLI. And um, to demo this, I've also created three additional users. So. I've got, you know, my traditional Rocket Skates user, which can do anything because it has the super user role. I've got my uh, mlister user, which all I can do is list the machines on the system. And I have mgetter, which can just get specific machines, and mdestroyer, which can just destroy machines. And I've got three machines on the system. Correct. 
Yeah, square brackets. A, B, and C dot KVM test dot local. It's a pretty standard blood out for me when I'm doing my testing. So, let's see. I'm going to list all my machines with my new mlister user. And he was able to list the machines. And I'm going to try to uh, get one of them. Minus P is uh, password. So foo is your password for mlister user. Yep. Oh, duh. not get show. Not, not get, yeah. <laughs> Okay, that, that's a new helper. Yep. Apparently not. And you can see that uh, aim lister doesn't have the right to get specific machines, and it, uh, the error that it returns tells you what went wrong. So it says cannot access the API, and it requires this specific permission to be able to do that. Same for in destroyer. Can't, can't, can't uh, show machines either, and you can't list them. So, what? What did I name that guy? I've already forgotten what I named these things. Him get her. But in getter is allowed to get uh, a dot kdm local dot test and we can see what's in there. It's the same information that's in the list, but uh, I keep the access controls uh, separate that way to make it slightly harder for someone who shouldn't be able to see everything on the system to not be able to see everything on the system. And of course, in destroyer can destroy things. And it's gone. I'll delete the other, and I'll delete the other one too. And when I do the list, now we've just got one little machine left hanging around. And only M getter can see it. And that's pretty much my very quick demo of how roles work. Perfect. Love it. Um, does that generate any questions from community in terms of how all that works, uh, what we just saw, et cetera? Pretty straightforward, I think. Um, excellent. We even have documentation that uh, in the- We uh, do. And tip that uh, goes through the role that goes through what the roles. Uh, so that's currently been published a tip in the uh, data architecture. Yeah, let me uh, share my other screen and I'll show. I'll show it. All right. All right so. Provision, and we go to doc and arch. We have off doc rst, and this should also hopefully be in tip of um, in the tip documentation on read the docs. So, and this goes over the this goes over what models we use to uh, build our authentication stuff. Uh, the lowest level we've got users, and the user can have a, a list of roles that uh, collectively grant access to uh, API endpoints for certain operations. Um, roles are built out of lists of claims, which contains, uh, which contains scopes and uh, specific uh, objects and actions. And we've got a couple of special actions. So for instance, um, the action action can restrict access to a specific action that you can take on an object. 
Uh, like if you want someone just to be able to power cycle machines via the IPMI controller, you can give them a uh, you can give them a role with a claim that just has a machines and action power cycle and star, and they'll be able to power cycle all the machines, but not take any other actions against them. Um, we also have special logic for update that allow you just the ability to update specific parts of uh, an object in the system. Like if you wanted people to only be able to update the names of machines, you can uh, build a role that says you can only update uh, the names of the machines and you can't do anything else on the system. And uh, roles are built out of claims and together they, uh, together the roles and claims, they form a whitelist of what you're allowed to do. Uh, if you're not allowed to do something by a role or a claim, then you're not allowed to uh, interact with the API at all and you'll get a permission error. Okay, excellent. I have a, I have a question too. So if, if I was doing, if I was using the Terraform plugin, which basically works by retrieving a list of inventory and then marking changes for it, would I be able to use this to basically overlay roles into the into the Terraform plugin. So I know Terraform requires me to put in the user identity that I'm, I'm using to, to get the machine. And then roles, if there were role restrictions, then I wouldn't even see machines. I couldn't act, I couldn't reserve machines I didn't have access to from that perspective. Uh, yes and no. And uh, okay. the reason I have to give you that answer is because uh, I draw a line between uh, distinguishing what you're allowed to do and what you're allowed to see and roles restrict what you're allowed to do um, and tenants which are the next thing on my list and i've gotten mostly working uh, they actually restrict what you're allowed to see and uh, if you want to get fine-grained with that it's better to use tenants than it is to use roles that that's a really helpful answer thank you no problem Okay, excellent. Thanks for the question, Rob. Um, anyone else with questions? Is there a plan to support groups of users? Um, it depends on precisely what you mean by groups of users. I mean, right now, uh, the um, the tenants is tenants is uh, plan the, the the definition that I'm working with for tenants. Um, basically, a tenant is an object that has a name, a list of objects that the tenant allows access to, and a list of users that are in the tenant. Um, so they can be grouped that way, but I wasn't, I haven't been planning a more abstract notion of a group of users yet. Okay. So, so essentially, tenants uh, become sort of a rich group. Um, more than just sort of a grouping of users, it's a grouping of users with additional uh, requirements around it or capabilities around it? Um, I wouldn't go that far because of the way tenants are being implemented. A, a user can't be in more than one tenant at a time. They can be at, they can be in uh, zero tenants or one tenant at a time. Okay. Okay. And there's some, there's some logic around how do I handle certain API interactions that it gets a lot crazier when you allow users to be in multiple tenants. And I don't want to deal with that right now. So if we need an additional user grouping mechanism, that's something that I'm open for, but it's the sort of thing that I have to have a specific use case to uh, start uh, planning out how to implement it. So I'm, I'm sorry, Stan, I stepped over your uh, question. What did you What did you want to ask? Oh, no, I, I just wondering the whole like long term role of uh, role um, roles and various other mappings associated with uh, well, that's, that's an ex yeah that's an excellent question which kind of segues into our next topic which is a uh, sort of general discussion on tenants and our back and uh, users and roles so I, I guess we'll just continue on the trend um, Greg and, and Victor did you um, have some information you wanted to lead off with in terms of um, where we're at today and what we're doing uh, Victor you're doing a lot of the heavy lifting here um, with the design and, and implementation. Um, uh, what's the current state, I guess, and what are some of the things you're working on? Obviously tenants, which you you just mentioned we're working on, and Greg is also working on our uh, UX backend. So just looking for an update from you guys. Okay, well, uh, roles are already out there and available in TIP. 
Um, and they, you know, there's some documentation that uh, probably needs to be expanded on, but it should be enough to get people going. Um, you know, the uh, main change that uh, comes with roles is that uh, unlike in pre-roles code, uh, not every user gets to be super user. By default, only Rocket Skates gets that. Gets that. Uh, and uh, you can actually, you know, create new roles and then remove super user from, from any user in the system so that uh, no one user has uh, complete authority. You can sort of, uh, you know, delegate uh, authority to specific uh, users or user types so, so that, you know, operators can't create users and, uh, you know, user managers can't uh, go in and start willy-nilly creating and deleting machines. Um, that's the sort of goal that I was looking for when I was designing the uh, how roles work. And um, tenants, uh, their current structure owes a lot to do with a couple of our customers that you want to be able to restrict, um, to be able to easily, you know, say this, you know, these sets of operators only have access to these sets of machines. And so the tenant mechanism is a way to define a list of objects that, um, or define a way to say, only objects that are in these lists are visible to this set of users. And so <clears throat> that's the idea with tenants, is that it is a mechanism for restricting visibility and that the roles are a mechanism of, uh, you know, restricting API access. So they, they can be they they can be related when it comes related in overlap when it comes to like the list and the get um, roles, but otherwise they're pretty separate. Okay, excellent. And I hope that uh, clear things up instead of confusing things more. <laughs> uh, so going forward, right now, tenants is the major topic on your your plate in terms of getting. Uh, development work done there. Do we have any other uh, current features or enhancements we're already looking for, looking forward to, but haven't started work on yet? Or are we in sort of a requirements gathering phase uh, for where we're looking to go next? Um, in terms of our back, I think once I get tenants wrapped up, that's going to be, uh, that's going to be it unless, you know, there are further, unless further experimentation by our users, uh, drive some more development along those lines or you know that'll be it for the near future at least uh i already have most of the unit testing done for tenants so you know i can verify that they work as advertised um but beyond that we'll be moving on to the next set of features which um i know we want to do some stuff with uh imaging um improving or replacing parts of curtain and uh a few other things on the table, but they seem to have eluded me for now. Okay. Uh, Greg? Yeah, no, I mean, that's UI for roles of tenants is a uh, high priority, and then uh, re -look, evaluating some of the image before stuff is what we're probably looking at uh, internally. Okay. Uh, any does that generate any more questions from community or any of the rest of us for that matter? Mm, the silence was deafening. Okay, uh, guys, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, I guess follow up question for uh, uh, Greg. Uh, where do you think uh, end of the week or next week we'll see some of the UX related pieces around our back come in? Yeah, hopefully by the end of the week. Okay, cool. So hopefully we'll be able to demo uh, the our back stuff through the UX uh, in the following uh, meetup and whatever else goodness we have cooked up for the community. Uh, and then uh, what version did our back uh, pieces start to land. Was it 3.8.0, 3.8.1, 3.8.2? So right now, there are no RBAC pieces in stable. They are currently in TIP for people to play with. So all the stuff Victor showed you is available in TIP. Uh, TIP will head towards 3.9. The expectations cool. and roles will be available in 3.9. And we'll coordinate that cut with uh, UX release. Perfect. Excellent. 
so those of you interested in playing with uh, the RBAC stuff and roles, uh, you need to pull tip to play with it. And uh, it's going to be a CLI operation for now until uh, Greg gets the UX pieces wrapped up uh, towards the end of the week or beginning of next week. Uh, following on to that, we are looking to release the capabilities uh, in 3.9. Uh, Victor, Greg, is 3.9 also going to include the tenant pieces, or are we going to do tenants as a 3.9.1 follow-on? Um, there are a couple more bits that I need to uh, unit test and validate in tenants. Um, if that goes well, that'll probably come out with 3.9. Yeah, I, I tend to wait and keep them together. But okay, cool. So we should look forward to uh, roles and tenants then in 3.9, um, although we'll always hedge and say it might slip and tenants might come out as a 3.9.1 point release, just in case, cover our bases. Yeah, part of me leans towards if tenant slips, we'll go to 3.10, just because it's a fairly, while it's not a breaking API change, it is an API change. You right. Pick up a new object type. So you pick up a new object type, and that object type has uh, implications on a couple of other operations, which I'll get into more whenever we have a tenant demo. Right. The 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 thought process there is that uh, if we're going to add an object, we should definitely at least move the minor number, even if it's a non-breaking change, right? So. Just so the API moves, so you can realize that there's something something in there that is substantial. Okay. Uh, that kind of wraps up discussion on tenants, roles, our back, uh, which leaves us with a little bit of time left over for opening up the floor for community. Um, so if anyone in the community, Rob, etc., we can, we include you in the community. I had a, uh, a minor UX tweak to talk about, too, if you want. Oh, perfect. Fire away. That'll, that, that'll oh, let that's people what you said in Slack. Slack. Okay. That's what I said in Slack. So, yeah, and, and it, that'll give people community a, l a little bit of time if they want to take a question. So there's a feature that we had requested for a while. Um, your Slack is on screen, by the way. Shane, Victor. stop sharing. That's not me. It's Victor. Uh, Victor. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, <laughs> there's been a requested feature so that if a job fails um, on a machine, uh, right now, the, the, the runner pauses, but there's no real indication that you have a problem on that machine, except that the runner's paused. So um, a recent change in the UX, I think that's gotten swept through into production with the 382 stuff, but it might still be in, in the earlier, in the testing stages, um, will capture events from jobs and then raise alerts in the UX on machines. So if a job fails, then the machine that's attached to that job will show up as having a failure on it. Big red scary letters. Um, so it will be pretty obvious to you that it happened. And then um, when the runner, when a new job comes in for that same machine that is working, it will um, clear that. Um, and so if you're in the UX, you will, you will get notifications in a couple of different places that you, that there's a machine that needs attention and when it's cleared if it's cleared by somebody else it'll it'll go away off your UX automatically because of the event system um, the one thing to note about that is that it is an in-memory thing only so there's no um, master database where this is tracked it's literally cached in your browser so if you refresh the browser uh, then you're gonna lose the cache of failed of failed job uh, machine job connection and you'll have to reset it. Um, if you're refreshing your browser all the time, that's actually a bug. It sh you shouldn't require a lot of machine re refreshes to use the UX. Um, sometimes it gets wedged and you have to, but for the most part, it should just keep running. Okay, excellent. So the moral of the story is if you find that you're refreshing the browser, stop. And if you feel you have to, let us know why so we can fix it uh, so you can maintain the uh, job cache 
job fail information uh, across this, the state changes when you're moving around in the browser. Okay, excellent. Any other? Uh, yeah. I was just it, it, it should really help if you're, especially if you're dev, if you're in a dev test mode, it'll really help you figure out that something broke. Right. So fast iterations and, and changes of uh, content authoring and testing. Um, any other business? No business. Okay. Uh, moving on. Last bit. We always like to open up the floor for community. If you have any questions, comments, thoughts, uh, want to talk to the team, now's your chance. Um, so we'll leave, uh, leave that open. Anyone interested in talking to us? Quiet day today. We like it. We'll wrap up early then. All right, folks. Thank you very much. Appreciate your attendance. We're going to wrap V17, and shortly when the recording gets done, uh, maybe a few minor edits in there. We'll push this out, and we'll update all the places. I uh, look forward to seeing all of you on whatever day two weeks is from today. Uh, so what is that, the 22nd? Something like that. 22nd or 24th? 22nd, I think. Uh, so Tuesday the 22nd, hope to see all of you for uh, meetup number 18. And thank you very much.